Uh, so, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm uh, Mohsen Rezaiat, uh, the Chief Solutions Architect at uh, Siemens uh, PLM. I'm going to spend the next uh, 25 minutes uh, uh, starting by introducing my division of Siemens to you and explain to you some of the work that uh, I do. And then I'm going to uh, give you uh, several examples of uh, how we are using augmented reality and virtual reality to create solutions for our customers. Uh, then I'm going to end my presentation with uh, an announcement for the early startups that might be uh, sitting in the audience to come and uh, partner with us to create uh, solutions that people think are impossible to create for uh, these customers. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, get going here. Uh, OK. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm the uh, head of R&D for a PLM division of Siemens. Uh, we are the software arm of uh, Siemens, Siemens being a very large company, uh, perhaps the largest company in Europe, uh, depending on the time of the uh, year or what year it is, we now have about 370,000 employees, um, uh, many uh, engineers, and uh, the division that I'm part of is uh, the main software division within, uh, within Siemens. We have over 77,000 customers, uh, over 9 million uh, licensed software that's uh, out there. We are also very active in the academic uh, arena. We have over 1 million uh, students that get trained uh, by our software. But my objective here is to really talk about the uh, industry and the solutions that we create uh, in uh, various uh, sectors. Here you're seeing five of those. The number in parentheses is the percentage of business that we do in each one of those sectors, uh, and you can see that uh, automotive and aerospace uh, are uh, uh, very uh, big for us, and uh, you are seeing examples of some of the largest customers that we have. Well, uh, these uh, customers are interested in uh, our software um, mainly because they see value in just about everything that they do. So when they are trying to design a complex product, and PLM stands for Product Lifecycle Management, uh, we basically manage everything about their work from the concept stage all the way to retirement of uh, that particular product. And they can basically use this integrated uh, set of uh, software to manage everything about that particular product throughout its, uh, its life. And you can see uh, the brand names for some of the products that we have, and I'll be talking about those more uh, during the conversation here. So I just wanted to get you familiar with some of the names like NX and Technomatics and Team Center that you will see uh, sprinkled throughout my, my presentation and how they relate to various uh, uh, phases of the life cycle. Well, uh, why is Siemens interested in augmented reality and uh, virtual reality? If you really look at every single phase of the life cycle from product design to production planning to production engineering and product execution and, and services, uh, you will see that better human-machine interaction leads to um, cost reduction and faster development, increased understanding and better quality. And as I mentioned, this is true at every single phase of the life cycle. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples here shortly. Uh, the examples are about the red areas that I've highlighted here. However, we know from discussion with our customers that even other areas that I haven't highlighted actually have the same, uh, same benefits. Before uh, showing you the um, use cases, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, again, the products that we use and some of the uh, devices that we have. Um, we actually have a product called uh, Concept Showroom that our customers are using to create cave environments. But uh, for those of you that are familiar with this technology, it's very costly. And now with newer technology, we can create the same uh, kind of ecosystem without the amount of money that was being spent on creating the, uh, the cave environment. So we are trying to really expand the scope of uh, VR and uh, get into uh, AR, augmented uh, reality. 
uh, we're going to use devices like uh, HTC Vive or Oculus, you may have heard these names, or even uh, Samsung Gear VR, which is a very low-cost uh, device. But also on the uh, augmented reality side, uh, we have HoloLens, you have a couple of them out there and you can uh, definitely try it and see some of the work that we have done with them. Uh, we have a representative from Dacry, uh, they are also working with uh, Siemens on creating some solutions. And then we are looking forward to uh, devices like Magic Leap and, uh, and Meta2. But the main thing I wanted to uh, discuss here is we actually have a bridge between our solutions and all of these devices that I was talking about, and that's called JT. Um, JT is a um, file format for exchange of uh, data between all these different applications. It's something that was created uh, by Siemens, but then it was offered to the industry. It's now an open ISO standard that even all of our competitors use. So if you get uh, any CAT system, it can import JT and export JT as well. So this is a way for uh, basically having an environment where multi-cat doesn't matter whether you're using a, uh, a P PDM product or PLM product or CAT product, it doesn't matter. JT is the, what make everything communicate with each other and that's what, therefore that's sort of the bridge. I put a plus next to it is because uh, we actually have recognized that augmented and virtual reality requires some additions to the JT file format and uh, my team is involved in putting some of those additional capabilities in it. Things like real-time uh, explosion uh, diagrams, ex exploded views that are extremely valuable. And again, if you uh, uh, come and uh, take a look at what we have at the table, you'll see some examples of that. So uh, this is some of the technologies and software that we're using. Uh, but also, uh, for our uh, research and development tool, to, uh, we need a development engine. We need an IDE environment, and we have decided to use Unity 3D. Uh, it's a tool that's really well known in the gaming industry, but we have found it to have a lot of applications for industrial uh, use cases as well. And uh, it allows us to basically write once and publish to many devices, because still the game uh, is not won by anyone. We have all the VR devices that I talked about, all the AR devices. We have no clue which operating system is going to win, which device is going to win, and therefore we want to be in a position that we can actually go to any of those depending on who will become the, uh, the winning uh, device amongst our customers. And therefore, if we can uh, get our JT file natively into Unity, then we can publish to, uh, to any device. And that's really the uh, direction we have chosen to, uh, to go. So I've talked about the software, I've talked about the development uh, engine. Let's now uh, look at uh, some of the use cases that uh, we are developing for our customers. And uh, this is the first one that uh, has come with uh, during conversations with several automotive and aerospace customers. Uh, training and uh, maintenance uh, is one of the areas where we, f we feel that these devices would have a lot of advantages. So just imagine, especially if you're talking about uh, distributed type of training or, or maintenance. So let's say you have a bunch of trainees in one location that are looking at an engine, or you have a person that is having trouble uh, in the field with uh, a physical device, and yet the expert or the uh, trainer is in a different location. So how do you make the most effective situation where the training can take place or an expert can give uh, advice? What you're seeing is perhaps people use video, but that's not really as effective. So what we believe you can do is to uh, create a virtual environment at the uh, remote location for, let's say, in this case, the um, tra trainer. And that trainer can see exactly what the trainees are seeing where the actual physical engine um, exists. Now, what we have done beyond that, we have a module called VizJack, uh, also uh, Process Simulate Human. There are actually two separate modules using the same engine, depending on whether you are on a factory floor or dealing with a part. But we can actually create uh, avatars of the individuals real time. So just imagine that person that's in the remote location being represented as an avatar in the other location, 
and being able to guide people as they're going through their steps. Again, that makes training a lot more effective. So you have a full body 3D reconstruction of, uh, of people in different locations, and therefore everyone is present, even though physically they are actually distributed. So we have augmented reality in one en environment and virtual reality in another one. And I just want to say very quickly, now during panel discussion, we probably can get into more details here, that there is a subtle difference between the two. And I'm sure many of you know this, but just to, to mention it, that when we are creating a virtual reality environment, now I'm not going to talk about the hardware requirements and all that, it's completely different. But a virtual reality environment is where you actually want to separate your user from the real world. You want to immerse them into the virtual world that you created for them, and you don't want them to know anything about the real world that they are currently in. And this is, in fact, why people get motion sickness, because their other sensory systems are telling them that they are in a different place than what their eyes are seeing. Now, with augmented reality, is exactly the opposite. You actually want your users to know exactly where they are at. So if they are in this location, you want them to know that they are here with all the objects that exist here, and then you want to place virtual objects in that environment that they can interact with other physical objects and with, uh, with the human. So you can kind of see that that's the main subtle difference between the two. One, you're trying to separate people from the real environment, and the other one, you actually are emphasizing where they are, and you want them to know that they are in that environment. So you can kind of see those two uh, in this example that, that we are showing here. The other use case is on inspection and work instructions. So um, let's uh, assume that you are looking at a car and you need to do a um, certain type of uh, repair or you, you're inspecting that, uh, that car. Uh, the old saying is, uh, you know, you want to uh, measure twice and cut once. So before you jump in and start unscrewing things and taking things apart, you pretty much want to know what you're dealing with. So again, with a augmented reality device, you can actually go and take parts out of uh, this uh, physical object without unscrewing a single part. You can then uh, see exactly where that part exists uh, in uh, relationship to other parts, so where it fits within the assembly, how it relates to the other parts, and so you can see the product structure shown on the other side. And this is something that um, is very unique to us because we basically use uh, the same amount of space to uh, show you the assembly tree, regardless of how deep it is and how many branches uh, you have. So again, uh, when you uh, try the HoloLens, we can go through that. But you can also go back to our Team Center module that I was talking about and get information about the replacement parts or the manufacturing characteristics of this part that you're looking at. Even things to the point, how much did it cost to create it? Uh, and what material is it made of, and uh, any kind of instructions you, you want to get about it from, uh, from the back-end system. Uh, once you have all of that information available to you, like what are the replacement parts, you can do all of that, all of that. then uh, you can kind of go and try to do your repair according to the work instructions that are put in front of your eyes. So again, having all the information available to you allows you to make the right decisions and kind of, as I said, uh, measure twice and cut once. This one is my favorite. Um, that's mixed reality simulation. So let's say I have a, a product, in this case uh, is a race car, and I perform a, um, a fluid flow analysis, an airflow simulation uh, of this car. I can actually pin the results, the airflows, the, uh, onto the uh, car itself and be able to walk around the car and take a look at uh, the simulation in the context of that car. And again, the meaning that I get out of looking at these results, and we have tested this with our customers, is, is amazing how much more you can uh, glean from something like this than if you're just looking at the simulation results uh, by themselves. We can also do work in very uh, amazing places. I think Orbital ATK is here. And uh, they work uh, with us and NASA. NASA is a great customer of ours. Uh, so uh, HoloLens, for instance, now exists on the space station. So we can imagine that uh, astronauts on the space station can actually start performing simulation. And let's say, simple example, they want to put an um, air conditioner up there. 
and they want to know if the noise and vibration interferes with their daily work uh, for this particular location, or if the airflow from that air conditioner is going to interfere with other uh, devices that they have. In this case, you could see the PC right above uh, where it, this is located, and maybe that interference is not acceptable. So uh, those kind of simulations could happen so that uh, if uh, something is built on Earth and sent up to the space station, we know exactly what it's supposed to do and where it's supposed to go, and its form factor is acceptable. So again, we don't have to do this uh, multiple times. But we can reverse this uh, scenario. Uh, what if we could uh, simulate what happens in space on Earth? So let's assume uh, an engineer um, at NASA, these are actually pods that are going to be used to colonize Mars. And uh, let's say that there is a utility box uh, on that pod on the outside. And the engineer on Earth wants to know uh, whether or not the space person can actually go and do the repair based on the instructions that are made available to them. So they can actually put on a virtual uh, spacesuit and look at the instructions and try to perform the repairs and decide whether or not uh, those instructions uh, can be followed uh, or not and make the necessary changes so that uh, people... And again, I think we all recognize that it's not easy to change things once they go to a space station or to Mars. So <laughs> you want to kind of uh, take care of all these issues on Earth before you send uh, things uh, up there. Uh, so I gave you several examples here, and my uh, hope is that you could see, um, uh, I have probably dozens of examples like this, and there are many others that we haven't thought about. So this is why I think we are here to uh, look for partners so that we can solve a lot of these problems, and uh, with that, we want to uh, make an announcement for a special type of partnership called the Frontier Partner Program that uh, Siemens offers. This is uh, specifically intended for early stage startups. We uh, give access to our uh, software. Uh, we also uh, provide free training and free support uh, for the software uh, for, for an entire year. Um, and we hope that uh, you're very successful with uh, developing on top of the technology stack that we uh, provide to you. Uh, we started the program in uh, 2014 um, uh, with additive manufacturing. It was actually done in uh, uh, Santa Clara, if I remember correctly. Um, it has been extremely successful. Then uh, in 2015, we did the advanced robotics. Uh, again, very successful and now we are uh, announcing the uh, Industrial Augmented Reality and Virtual Reality uh, Frontier Program. You can kind of see um, uh, some of the software examples that you get as part of this uh, program. There's actually even more uh, that we haven't uh, included here. Uh, the point being that it's not just the software, it's actually the support that you get from us for free. We have had examples of uh, Frontier partners that have come actually to our offices for two or three days and they've spent time with our developers uh, to, uh, to learn exactly how to use the software properly. Uh, and again, uh, we recognize the value, so uh, this is all uh, free of charge for, for those customers. Um, now, I think the last the slide that I have uh, just uh, goes into why um, should you uh, consider Siemens? Uh, well, we have a proven technology, um, as i uh, shown here, about 40% of the world's uh, 3D data is being managed by uh, our software. I already mentioned the 77,000 uh, customers and over 9 million licenses, but we also have 500 plus resellers across the world. So just imagine for a uh, startup, if you have a successful product, uh, you will have uh, uh, worldwide presence without uh, spending your valuable resources to, uh, to get that presence. So uh, I think this is uh, uh, extremely valuable. So with that, uh, I think I've uh, done the three things I wanted to accomplish. So thank you so much for <laughs> thank, your attention. Thank you, Mosin.